All right, lesson three, George Bush ushering in the post-Cold War world. Things seem like they are going to be moving in a Hakuna Matata kind of a direction, but not necessarily. Crisis in the Middle East yet ensues. Terrorism will be an issue yet in the coming years. Here we go, the election of 1988. George Bush, George H.W. Bush runs against the Democrat Dukakis and wins a sweeping victory. Not quite as sweeping as the past Reagan years, but uh, gets a victory as his vice president, now the president, president elect, and riding on the coattails a bit of the Reagan administration successes and accomplishments, saying there's going to be a kinder and gentler America. A thousand points of light are going to come together. American organizations and government are going to work to have a kinder, gentler America than we have had in the past. Again, in the 1980s, still reeling from past co conflicts and turmoil of the 60s and the 70s. Vietnam syndrome, that kind of thing is still kind of there. One of his pledges in that campaign was, read my lips, no new taxes. Oh boy, better be careful. That's going to come back to haunt him. So it's in his presidency that the Iron Curtain crumbles literally in the sense of the Berlin Wall coming down in November of 1989. Uh, there are significant numbers of people protesting uh, the, the wall and communism, and it comes down on that particular day. European nations uh, in that green area, the satellite nations of the Soviet Union, embrace democracy, and it's, things start to fall apart and really fall apart in 1991 as Russia declares that the Soviet Union is officially broken apart. Uh, they embraced democracy. They worked toward democratic reforms, not without a little bit of turmoil, though. Uh, one of the concerns here is uh, a great national security, inter international world security concern with this. We'll get to in a little bit. But Gorbachev, the reformer former of Glasnost, uh, and Paris Dorekin is going to step down as leader of the USSR as Boris Yeltsin is elected president, as you see him there. The countries in the multicolors uh, colors there were on the fringes, very uh, multi-ethnic countries, nations, uh, many of them in the southern part there, uh, Islamic uh, Muslim backgrounds uh, are going to form their own countries, but Russia is going to try to maintain some control and connections to them in the future. Uh, failure of the Soviet Union, why years of military build up over spending, the pressure placed on the Reagan administration is attributed as one of those factors that helps economically break it down. It was probably also breaking down in a week already before that. Uh, there was a little economic growth. Uh, they were stagnant in that sense. Uh, there were attempts at reform, but it just had failed. Uh, and the war in Afghanistan was their Vietnam. It was a problem as well. Other events like the uh, great meltdown at the Chernobyl uh, nuclear reactor site, which was still kind of shut off to the world up until recently for some tours, I believe, uh, was uh, part of a great amount of discontent uh, at, uh, that affected the population of, of the country there. And so they're working to form something like a democracy. The Russian Federation is formed in 1991, uh, and uh, there is uh, this loose organization of these new countries and Russia who are trying to cooperate and coordinate with each other. Keep in mind that around the edges of Russia in those new nations is where a lot of the nuclear weapons were. Uh, and one of the key concerns was who has control of the nuclear weapons, are they properly being accounted for, that kind of thing. Uh, the failure of the Soviet Union sees a significant amount of sales of Russian military weaponry and things by people in the military and others, I guess, that get their hands on them for profit because times are tough. Uh, scientists will also leave the Soviet Union or we should say now Russia, uh, to uh, seek employment elsewhere. And other countries do recruit them, and that's a scary thing as well. Countries that we don't want to have a nuclear bomb are seeking that kind of knowledge and information. So uh, it's Bush and Yeltsin that usher in this new era. Uh, where are those nuclear bombs? So we go from the old, old world order, right, looking like that on the left, and we're familiar with that, to looking like this, largely in Europe. The map is a little bit adjusted there in the southern part of it especially, uh, but 1991 is where things transition to a uh, map that's similar to what we have today in that particular region. But take note, current events, 2020-21, since 2014, been a lot of turmoil, some, some violence in the Ukraine. Uh, there are pro-Russian uh, uh, 
um, revolutionaries trying to overthrow the government of UK, Ukraine there, uh, point of contention here today. In 2014, that little tip of land there called the Crimean Peninsula was annexed by Putin, and uh, the, largely the world, most countries seemingly say that was done illegally. So is Russia back on the march? They're trying to push back against NATO a little bit here. Uh, and one of the issues is, is NATO is still valid? Do we really need NATO yet? But in terms of the United States military, uh, we are still easily then the superpower of the world, but then the United States starts to say, okay, now since the Cold War is over and the big threat is gone, we can restructure the military, we can reduce spending on it, put it to domestic programs, right, and uh, address uh, issues uh, and conflicts around the rest of the world and uh, with not nearly as much uh, of, of a military force. Uh, but again, the question is, do we need NATO? Is it needed? Well, it'll stay, it'll stay around. It'll still try to grow its membership with some of those newly independent Eastern European countries. Again, one of the biggest concerns in the post-war time period here, post-Cold War time period, is who has control of those nuclear weapons? The stockpiles are going to start coming down. A boomerang impact or effect of this falling apart of the Soviet Union is the neighbor in Asia, China sees a revolutionary event here in Tiananmen Square in 1989. Young activists show up in mass in huge numbers. This is like uh, huge numbers of people in the million showing up uh, in the middle of Washington, D.C. saying, we want reform as well. The Chinese government uh, brings in the tanks, the military, and they harshly push this down and not without uh, people being arrested, severely beaten, injured, and some deaths occurring and put people going to prison as well. President Bush criticized China's actions, uh, said that they need to listen to those reforms and reform. Uh, it's all over the TV, on CNN and the major news networks, for example, uh, but nothing really happens in terms of reforms in China. And so uh, the impact is felt in this particular country, the failure of the Soviet Union in this way. But we still conduct relations with China, even though there was criticism that we should not, perhaps, because of abuses there or the harsh actions of the government against the activists. Nuclear disarmament is going to continue to grow here in this time period into the 1990s, right? We've been to salt one with Nixon. That was a happy thing. That worked out well. There was also the nuclear non-proliferation treaty before that and a nuclear test ban before that. And there are some other treaties involving that kind of thing in here too. Uh, but Carter, Carter uh, renegotiated SALT in SALT two, but it didn't happen because of that Soviet invasion of Afghanistan. We didn't sign it, didn't propose it. Reagan has his INF treaty signed, reducing nuclear weapons there, and you can see it's at that point of Reagan with his uh, treaty and then his pre uh, his uh, successor, George H.W. Bush, with the START-1 treaty that we're going to go over here a little bit, and later on, Clinton and SALT II, and several others, George W. and Obama in the SORT treaty and START treaty, the new START treaty, uh, continually bring those nuclear stockpiles down. You can see the nations that have them. There's still a lot of them there. There are still way more than enough to have a nuclear Armageddon, but... Uh, Getting off of your outline notes here and basically going to some of the information you might put in your chart. Uh, it's Bush and Gorbachev that did agree to bring these things down, but it's not signed until we get uh, Yeltsin in office. And this start one treaty, Strategic Arms Reduction Treaty, cuts 10% of U.S. and 25% of Soviet nuclear weapons. And to an agreement also to limit ICBM warheads to 1,100 each, and then to agree also then to start reducing it further. Now, both of these countries would basically send in inspectors and watch as these things were dismantled or destroyed. Underground missiles, literally uh, missile silos blown up in the Dakotas, uh, for example. My brother actually got to see a few of those. He's an engineer from North Dakota, graduate of North Dakota State, Bill Bison. Um, and so we are in this denuclearization era, right? Still more to be done. The big topic that you're going to hopefully watch a little bit on in the uh, Ed Puzzle uh, previously here, uh, focusing on the first Gulf War, uh, uh, is is the uh, high point of the Bush administration, right? As we talked about before and introduced to you, the Iran-Iraq War ended in 1988. It was completely very brutal. Uh, we supported Iraq and Saddam Hussein because they were fighting against our, our arch enemy, Iran. Uh, and out of that, Iraq accumulates a huge war debt. Uh, Saddam Hussein, to kind of recoup some of that money, decides that Kuwait should be mine. There's a lot of oil there. It gives me greater access to the Gulf. Historically, it was 
part of Iraq in the past, so we're just taking back what was ours uh, traditionally, historically, uh, and this oil issue could solve his economic problems and a greater access to the ports that are going into the Persian Gulf. And so this was really concerning for the world because he is making a move to control a major portion of the world's oil supply, and then the question would be, and that would affect all industrial Western nations, and if he were to shut it off, and or perhaps invade Saudi Arabia, OMG, what would happen then? Uh, he could have a monopoly on all of this. And so George W. Bush, H.W. Bush, and other Western countries, but the United States especially, forms an alliance, works to put together a coalition to say, Saddam, you got to leave Kuwait. That's not acceptable. The United Nations uh, starts making statements about it. Uh, and again, the concern here is that other oil nations especially Saudi Arabia, the big one, would be uh, taken over next, and he would have a monopoly on things. Uh, the United Nations insisted he leaves Kuwait. He refuses. Bush puts this coalition of countries together to oppose the invasion, uh, and the alliance included now, uniquely here, Western countries, NATO countries, come together with Islamic countries, Egypt, Saudi Arabia, for example, European countries. They're coming together, and they're basically saying, get out or else, All right? And Bush orders troops to the region. Uh, eventually, we send about a half a million troops to protect the Saudi Arabian border. This is called Operation Desert Shield, put up a shield against Saddam Hussein in case he tries to invade Saudi Arabia. And this presence of Western, uh, Western people forces was something that was unprecedented, really. Uh, Saudi Arabia is a, kind of, in a way, a very closed society, and Westerners, uh, non-believers, and the Islamic faith uh, were very much frowned upon. You know, there are American and European oil companies there uh, at that point in time and had been there before, but people coming in huge numbers and bringing in Western ways, uh, people who you know drink alcohol, which is not a cool thing there, uh, people who uh, in, in some cases the United States military has women uh, showing their faces is not a cool thing there. Uh, there was This was seen as a threat and another action or opportunity for the West to come in and take over this region of the world or their country in a way or have to undo influence over them. Bush goes on national television. He gives this speech saying this is what happens. This coalition, it's just not the United States, this coalition of countries are standing up to Saddam Hussein and this unjust invasion of Kuwait and they will take action if he doesn't leave by X date and time. And so this date, red line date, passes and uh, the invasion happens. This is Operation Desert Storm. Okay, So the UN Security Council, though, passed a resolution before this saying that the invasion, if it occurs, shall only be about the goal of restoring the government of Kuwait. It will not be about toppling Saddam Hussein. This is going to be very controversial in the aftermath. The invasion is going to be led by U.S. General Norman Schwarzkopf, Chairman of the Chief Joints of Staff, nicknamed Storm and Norman. It's, a, again, a U.S. US uh, forces and a coalition of other forces that begin a massive bombing campaign of Iraq and Kuwait. It's seen all over live TV uh, with uh, reporters in Baghdad, for example. Uh, on the ground, it's commanded by a guy by the name of General Colin Powell, who will later on be a part of a future president's cabinet. It's still around here with us today. Uh, and there is portrayed for the world the technological capabilities of the United States military. Laser-based guided missiles, things like that. Uh, replays of missiles hitting their targets. Uh, literally talking about those missiles having the capability of being put through windows and doors with that kind of accuracy. And the point was always made, this is a war that is going to have death, but we're trying to, with our technology and our accuracy, to minimize civilian deaths as much as possible, We're just going after those that are the combatants. Uh, there is about, uh, on February 23rd, after the air attacks to kind of weaken uh, the Iraqi forces uh, occurs here over a brief number of hours, uh, the ground war attacks, uh, a million uh, Iraqis are facing those coalition forces uh, and they invade in the directions that you see there. 
Uh, they're devastated within a matter of a few days. Again, this is seen all over TV in a pretty visual way, in a very brutal way. Um, but that, I guess, is war. Uh, but Kuwait is liberated after five days and a ceasefire occurs. Uh, the Iraqis uh, have uh, experience of, of, of hundreds of thousands of, of casualties in all of this. Uh, the United States deployed a new type of missile that was supposed to shoot down other missiles called the Patriot missile, still in use here today. Uh, there was this event also as the war was going on and the, the invasion was going on. Uh, these Scud missiles that were kind of low tech, very inaccurate, being fired from Iraq into Israel, uh, killing American soldiers. Uh, killing some people in Israel, uh, kind of a scary thing, but kind of random, kind of like random uh, fired missiles in World War II, the B-1, B-2 rockets uh, used by the um, uh, Nazis on Britain, uh, but some of them were also shot down by those Patriot missiles. Uh, this, at the aftermath of the whole event, uh, sees uh, a little bit of scorched earth tactics taken on here by uh, Saddam Hussein and his forces. As they retreat, uh, they destroy, they blow up, they burn everything related to oil. They blow up and set a fire to these oil wells all over the place. And it becomes the, the biggest environmental uh, disaster the world has really ever probably seen. Uh, but uh, it's going to take years of cleaning this up. There was black smoke and soot uh, all over the region for a good period of time as uh, uh, countries sent in specialists to, to uh, shut down those fires and restore the flow of oil again to the rest of the world. But in the aftermath now, when it's done, again, they stop short of invading the rest of Iraq. Saddam Hussein is still in power, uh, but the NATO countries and this coalition of countries establish no-fi zones over a northern part of Iraq and the southern part of Iraq to kind of create a defensive barrier and pin in between those two lines, Saddam Hussein and his forces with constant flights of warplanes over the next 10 years and enforced by NATO, again, a coalition of this to kind of keep him in, kind of a time out for 10 years. You can't have your military forces or have any activity there. This is also in a way, a way to try and prevent Saddam Hussein from abusing uh, minority groups within the country as well as he was notorious for doing and using weapons of mass destruction against them. He had gassed people in the north uh, up, up here in, in this particular region and other places that opposed him. Uh, we're very concerned about weapons of mass destruction. This is going to come up here in the future. Uh, does he have nuclear uh, weapons? For sure we knew he had chemical weapons and that kind of thing. Uh, he will undergo and be required to have weapons inspectors check out what he has uh, in those particular years leading up to the second Gulf War. Now again, this whole process of the strategy and the goals of the event, uh, again, were controversial. Again, the United Nations said that this is going to be all about peace in the Mideast uh, and restoring the sovereignty of Kuwait and not toppling Saddam Hussein. Uh, the positives of this is that it did bring East and West together in this event. It was a cooperative event. And so U.S. prestige and world affairs really improves in all of this. Uh, the Allied coalition uh, forms uh, uh, a bond there with, uh, uh, with each other and the members of the nations of the East and the West. Uh, and this coalition, again, was formed only, and they agreed to cooperate only with the idea that this was liberating Kuwait, not overthrow some of Saddam Hussein, right? And criticism of this will come later as the war on terror post 9-11 event occurs and we invade Afghanistan, then we invade Iraq because we believe he has nuclear weapons and that he also helped support and train Al-Qaeda and Osama bin Laden's people. Why didn't we take him out before and we wouldn't have had 9-11 perhaps, right? And But the rationale is presented here. Bush was critiqued for this uh, and this idea. Uh, that you should have went after Saddam Hussein and 9-11 would have been perhaps avoided and other terrorist activities would have been avoided. Uh, but he at the time said the major reasons for sticking with this goal and having this goal, restore Kuwait and that's it, uh, is that cooperating Arab nations would have disapproved of an occupation or a further invasion of another Arab country and therefore would not have cooperated. Uh, the coalition would have crumbled and it would have opposed that idea. If we did that, then we would have a much bigger war and a bigger event. There'd be 
many more civilian innocent casualties in the event. Russia would disapprove. We're just getting on a good, getting into a good relationship with them, and it might reignite our Cold War. We don't want to go in that direction either. Uh, it would make the Middle East peace talks near impossible as well if we expanded an invasion into an occupation of Iraq, again, irritating other Islamic countries and leaders and all of this. And so our, our situations and decisions to do anything are always very complex. It's, if you're not, it's, a, it's a very multifaceted and uh, factorial kind of a situation. Uh, after the Gulf War, Bush has this huge popularity surge. I don't know if any president ever experienced a rating of 90% ever, even for a brief period of time like he did. It seemed like he's going to get a second term in this election of 1992, but the economy again enters another recession. 10% unemployment. Uh, he had to raise taxes. He had to break his promise. And no president again has ever won re-election when the economy is bad. And it holds true to today. And so uh, he is going to lose to Bill Clinton. More on that with that significantly influential fellow there, Ross Perot, helping break up that electoral vote to give Bill Clinton the win. Your left-hand side or your backside of your notes here uh, are simply uh, a chart. Uh, make sure you read through some of the fine print on some of the events there. Two key conflicts, Panama invasion, uh, are significant there under George Bush to know and understand as well. It's the first time that the stealth bombers were used in 1989, uh, and then also detailing the agreements involving nuclear weapons and NAFTA. NAFTA is negotiated. You really got to know this. And then NAFTA is negotiated under George Bush. It's in your top five, your, your top five terms and your terms list. Uh, break it down there a little bit with the resources I provide for you. It'll be Clinton that actually signs it in. But recently, of course, NAFTA has been renegotiated by the Trump administration. So that's the end of the day. Make hate. This is the third lesson. We just got a couple more and good day.